Jessica, Mary Hampson, um, you came across this lady because you uh, found a, a pamphlet, uh, came across a pamphlet uh, in an auction, was it? And you bought it. Yeah, it was at a rare book auction, and I thought to myself, I haven't, I haven't heard of this woman before. So I went ahead and put a bid in, just speculatively, and um, I'd gone away for Christmas. When I came home, I, I realized I'd gotten it, and mm. so um, when it came, I couldn't believe the story that this woman was telling about her life. She starts off as a, a very modest, young, gentlewoman living with her widowed mother in um, near Ely, and she's 17 years old, and um, the vicar brings over this gentleman from a good family. His father was a baronet. He's a second son. He's a promising lawyer, Robert Hampson. Um, and she, her family's thinking this is a good deal, you know. He's got a nice townhouse in uh, in London, um, good prospects. Mm. And what, what what period is this? It's this been... is um, well, he comes in 1650 is 1650, when he shows up on her doorstep in the 1650s. Yeah. So a good catch then. Yeah, a good catch. Mm. And she's not a bad catch in herself. She's um, the only daughter of a, a widow. Um, she's the heir of her father. Not a lot of money, but you know, a decent amount of money. But also she's related to the uh, Wingfield family, which was quite a prominent family in the area and had, um, you know, had played important roles in, in government you know, in the past. So you know, she was a good catch for a second son with prospects. Mm -hmm. Connect, bringing together to the Wingfields are a much older family. The Hampsons were a newer um, gentry family, so it was a nice marriage. The only slightly unusual part was that he was 29 and she was 17, but that was you know that was not a huge obstacle. In her pamphlet, she makes it sound like they got married and things went really wrong very quickly, but other um, documentary evidence shows that they had about two years, two to three years of happiness. They had um, a daughter first, and then a son. The son who obviously died in infancy because there's no record of him when things start going very badly. And Mary doesn't actually mention him in her pamphlet at all. So, um, so they start off having a fairly nice, typical gentry marriage. They have a, they have a house in London. His, uh, Robert Hampson's sisters live with them and everything seems to be very nice. You know, she's the head of a nice gentry family. And then uh, one evening, as she describes it, um, Robert's sisters, take him to task because he owes them money, a lot of money, and he doesn't have it. And they threaten to take him to court. And indeed, they do take him to court. There's documents, uh, court documents that show they do take him to court. So she had no idea that their financial situation was so precarious. And she has to give up her jointure, um, which is the money that was settled on her if Robert were to die. It was, the kind, of, it was a kind of an insurance policy for women. Um, and she agrees to that. Um, even though when they go to the judge, she's underage, and the judge says she can't really agree to it. So they go to, a, I think, kind of like a, a, a loan shark who accepts her, her signature and, and gives Robert the money. And then everything falls apart. Um, the house, they, they move out of the nice house. She gets put in lodgings. He goes riding the legal circuit because he was a lawyer. She has a, she's quite pregnant with her third child. Um, and when he comes back um, again, she's moved again. And that's when the beatings start. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, she, when she gets pregnant with her fourth child, um, she questions him about his financial situation, and he doesn't like that. And so he uh, beats her quite severely. Um, and she's quite ill then for quite some time. And he abandons her. So she has, her mother has to come and take care of her. Um, and then she decides to go to France. And it's interesting because if you look at um, women's um, women who are abused in the, the period, the doctors were pretty much, they didn't have much legal basis to help the women, so they tried to use their medical expertise. And her doctors, they told her she needed, that her, her father died of consumption, and so she, she was very ill and she should go to France to recover. And so um, in that way they could kind of get her out of that abuse situation for a little while anyway. Um, so she goes to France, stays there for a, a while, and then comes back and moves in with Robert. You mentioned that uh, Robert um, uh, wasn't uh, doing very well in his business, but he, that, that was not just a one-off, was it? it? It was just continuous, this. And that wasn't that the root of the problem? Uh, yeah, it was the root of the problem. I, I mean, there are, he did have some unfortunate financial situations um, that weren't in his control, but he also made some poor choices. His father left him quite a lot of land in the Fenlands, the Bedford Levels project, which they expected at the time was going to make everybody massive amount of money. And 
his father left him uh, the, the property that he'd bought when he bought in at the, at the beginning. And that, uh, and, but Robert was supposed to give his brothers and sisters about 2,000 pounds, which is quite a lot of money in that period, for their portion. And, but it was believed that he would make thousands and thousands of pounds out of this property. In the end, uh, several, two decades later, his daughter sold that property for about 150 pounds. It never made the kind of money that it was supposed to make. So from a very, you know, from a very early stage, Robert was already financially in difficulties. Um, but he also made other investments that um, didn't work out very well. He, he, built, uh, he rebuilt some of uh, buildings in the Inner Temple as an investment mm. after the Great Fire of London. And those, uh, one of those burnt down in kind of questionable circumstances. And a, a lawyer actually died in that, that fire. So and then he was pretty much ruined. And so really the only money he ever had was the money he got from Mary. He kept asking her to sign off her jointure so he could sell bits and pieces. And um, she didn't want to, especially after she realized what a poor financial situation he was in. She wanted to keep a hold of the only security she had should he die. Um, and that made him very angry because he felt it was, his, it was his property, his land. He should be able to sell anything he wanted. And legally he could, but a lot of people wouldn't buy land that was caught up in jointures because they thought there would be lawsuits afterwards. So even though Mary couldn't file a lawsuit against him, someone could do it for her. So a lot of people wouldn't get involved in that. So that, that also caused um, beatings and, and the big incident when she returns from France with the pistol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it was, uh, a, uh, it went for, uh, this incident went for about um, three days, where initially he, uh, he tells her that she doesn't sign it, he won't let her eat anything, he, um, and he'll kick her out. So for a couple days she doesn't, she's not given any food. Um, her, her maid sneaks in some broth, but um, she's, she's, he's trying to starve her out and get her to leave. If she leaves the house and he locks her out, then he can say she's abandoned him, and hopefully then he's rid of her. Um, was that a big thing in those days? Uh, if, they, if the lady left, uh, did it in fact mean the, the marriage was null and void and, and, they, and he would get the money? Well, they would, try, so they would often try that. Um, in a lot of these marital abuse cases, either kicking the wife out of the house with sometimes with, you know, in her night clothes. Um, there's other stories that women have written um, about that kind of situation. And even Anne Clifford, um, the great lady Anne Clifford, is, alludes to being locked out of her house with her second husband at one point. We don't know the details of it, but she does mention in a letter that sh she daren't come up to London in case her husband kicks her out of the house like he'd done before. So this was either kicking them out of the house um, and so that they, they're forced to go somewhere else and then they, it can be claimed that they left. Now there was always, of course, you know, back and forth and, and arguments about this, but at least they, they could start off saying, well, she's not here, is she? Or on the other hand, they would lock them in the house so they couldn't get out. So yeah, decide, you know, either locking them in or, or, or kicking them out and, was pretty and, common. And the pistol, what, what, what happened with the pistol? The pistol, well, they'd been fighting for a few days and it, there's not only Mary's version in her pamphlet, but there's also Mary and Robert's version in the High Court of Delegates um, testimony and also the Court of Arches testimony where they, where they were, when they were getting their separation. So as Mary tells it in her pamphlet, um, after he had beaten her um, and she tried to make, up, make it up with him, he held a pistol to her throat and uh, threatened to kill her. And that's when she left the house. But she. They were living in the inner temple then, and she only goes to the inner temple gate, so she can claim that she didn't actually leave. She was just actually she just got out of she's just out of the house. Um, in the High Court of Delegates and the the Court of Arches depositions, it's much more graphic. Um, it talks about um, Robert coming in and beating her, dragging her through the house with by her hair. It um, describes how she. And I think she's, she was trying to play this down a bit, how she um, stabbed him with a pen knife. But she says that he just grabbed her hand and she had the pen knife in it. So he grabbed her hand and that was how he hurt himself. Whereas he said she attacked him with the pen knife. Um, she did say she pulled his hair, but she didn't. She says she pulled his hair, but none came out. 
and that was just to defend herself. Um, he says that yes, he kicked her in the butt and he, um, he pushed her um, and that he did take the pistol and show it to her to frighten her. She says that he held it to her breast and that it was filled with powder and shot. So there was some argument and it was in his best interest in the court battles to make it seem that he was simply warning her. He was simply chastising her in a husbandly fashion and it was her, important for her to prove that he was violent and cruel and threatened to kill her. And, and in a way that's where the pamphlet comes in because that, that was uh, Mary's uh, riposte if you like if, uh, in court. Um, that, that's what she had to, to do basically uh, to put her side of the, uh, the argument for. She did end up getting her separation. She did get an alimony of 100 pounds a year which he never paid or he seldom paid. Um, and she kept going back and forth between France and London um, and at one point he was telling people she was dead. We see evidence of that in another legal document when he's trying to get the property from her uncle and the income from that for his daughters supposedly but of course he would have control over it. So he actually says she's dead and that's why he should get this property. Um, so she comes back and she tries to get him to pay to prove she's alive. In that point, at that point, he has his clerk throw her out into the uh, the street and tells people she's a mad woman. And then she's a mob comes together and beats her, and a woman has to kind of pull her out. And she said that she lost her earring and and that um, she daren't go back and speak to him again in case um, he murdered her. So um, she was quite. So then she went back to France, but her her reputation as a gentlewoman was pretty much destroyed by that point. She had some, some powerful friends, the Montagues, Mary Montague, who was actually um, a friend of the poet Catherine Phillips, was a, a great advocate for Mary. And maybe the, the friend that Mary talks about in the pamphlet when she says a friend asked her to write this. And uh, it didn't really stop there, did it, with, the, with Robert, her husband. Um, she even had trouble with her children, didn't she? Yeah, um, two of her daughters survived. Her youngest daughter, the daughter that was born after the beating, she died when she was um, about four years old. But the other two daughters uh, went, uh, grew into adulthood. One of them married, um, and when Robert Hampson died in 1689, at that point, the income from Mary's property from her uncle should have come back to her. Uh, Mary was in France at that time. Um, well, she tries to get that money again, and her daughters and her son-in-law are telling everyone she's dead. In fact, in one legal document, it says that they were telling people she was dead in a ditch, <laughs> um, and that she was a terrible mother, and that she ruined Robert, and all of this. And all this is, again, in more court documents. Um, and at one point, she has to walk from London to Cambridge to prove to the tenants that she is alive and that they should pay the money to her and not to her son-in-law. So um, they never reconcile. She never reconciles with her daughter. She moves in with a, a, cup, a mother and daughter, and two more Marys, mm -hmm. the Uphovens, and she lives with them for about eight years until she dies. And she leaves her property to the young Mary, and not her own daughters. And, and you mentioned um, Anne Clifford earlier, a uh, very famous lady. Um, Mary Hampson, uh, not quite as famous. Uh, is this uh, common for uh, gentlewomen of that time? W w was this a, a common, uh, you know, if you married badly, were there lots of bad marriages uh, that uh, resulted in violence and court claims and being thrown out and, and what have you? There's a fair number um, that I ran across as I was doing the research for this book. There's, uh, because women were under what they call coveture, um, in marriage, they had very little legal um, power, they had very little financial power inside their marriage. And so if that went badly, um, then you know, that could result in all sorts of, of problems for the women. Um, and there are, uh, there are a fair number of, of um, court documents that show different women suffering and also uh, other pamphlets and uh, manuscripts that women in these situations experienced. Um, and it was probably much more widespread than we know because going to court was the last, the last resort because if you got Why a separation, if you got a separation, then socially you were um, ostracized for the most part. And financially it was terribly um, uh, difficult for you. And if you didn't have family to back you up, then you were in even more trouble. And it went down all the social ladder. Um, 
from you know pretty very modest people to quite wealthy people. I mean, it is interesting with Mary Hampson and and Clifford because they have some strange connections, um, although they would they would not have recognized each other. I mean, well, Mary might have realized that about, that Ann, uh, that Anne Clifford. Uh, was this great lady, but um, at one point Mary is living just down the road from Anne Clifford's daughter. Um, in one of uh, the court cases, Mary is using the same lawyer that Anne Clifford is using. So I mean, I, I assume the legal world is a small world. Um, and also, the secretary Coventry who questions Mary was Anne Clifford's son son-in-law. So there's this interesting uh, connection between them, although they didn't realize it. But yeah, I mean, women were uh, married. Women were in a terribly vulnerable situation if um, if things went badly. Is Mary's case probably the worst you've come across? Um, it's not the worst I've come across. Um, there's a woman uh, named Cunningham who lived in in um, Scotland, and her husband um, continually kicked her out of the house. Continually kept her on short rations. Um, one night he he put her out in a Scottish winter in her nightdress. And he kept a mistress, um, and so while Mary's um, was difficult, you know, it wasn't the worst. And there, there were lots of murders actually, husbands murdering their wives, and Mary didn't get murdered, so I guess that was <laughs> better than some of the stories. So it wasn't, it's not the worst story, but it's certainly, um, it's one of the most detailed stories that's told in a woman's own words in the period. Um, so in that way, it's quite unusual. And the fact that she published this is also fairly unusual. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.